What is up, you guys? We are gonna be chatting all about my most recent Disney trip today. So I'm gonna be answering all of your questions that you guys asked over on Instagram and then some other Disney questions. So we're just gonna be chatting about a lot today. So I love doing these Q&A videos every month or two. It's just fun to sit down and chat with you guys in the middle of a vlog series and just kind of take a break from that for a minute and chat with you guys. So let's go ahead and dive into the first question. Thoughts on Old Key West for toddlers. Is the theming good? Where would you take a four-year-old for a birthday? I love Old Key West. I mean, it's no secret <laughs> that I love Old Key West. I think it's great for toddlers and preschoolers. They have an incredible little sandy play area by the playground. And then even if you're not near the main hospitality house, they also have another pretty large playground by the pool in the Old Turtle Pond Road section of the resort. So really, no matter where you are in the resort, you can access toddler-friendly playgrounds, which is really fun. Another reason I think Old Key West is really good for toddlers is because instead of the very elaborate splash pad, they just have the kiddie pool, which might seem like a downgrade when you compare it to Wilderness Lodge, Grand Floridian, Polynesian, you know, these elaborate splash pads that just look over the top. The theming's incredible, but at least for my three and a half year old, she is not a fan of water just being dumped on top of her. She really doesn't even enjoy the slides quite yet because when she goes down, she's still little enough to where the water is splashing up all in her face and she just doesn't love that. So I really appreciate the kiddie pool because it allows Ellie a little more freedom and independence to play in the kiddie pool where I can give her some toys, I can sit with her, she can play on her own and she feels a little more comfortable comfortable. So that's another reason I love Old Key West. I just feel like the pool situation is a better fit for toddlers. Of course, transportation here is a little bit of a sacrifice with little kids. You don't have the monorail, the Skyliner, the boat to any of the parks. You do have the boat to Disney Springs, but when it comes to the parks, your bus only like that is it that is a sacrifice with old key west but for me the amount of money that we are saving to stay in a one bedroom or even a studio is so significant <laughs> that it's worth the sacrifice of being bus only you are sacrificing that extra 10 to 15 minutes of additional stops around the resort but again for me i think it's worth it when i can stay in a one bedroom villa for $300 a night, you know, the same cost as some of the moderate resorts sometimes. I mean, that's worth it to me. So it just all comes down to what your priorities are, but I think Old Key West is great for kids. You can upgrade to the one bedroom for the lower price point. The pool situation is great. There's lots of food options. You just have to be okay with the buses. Old Key West one bedroom versus Art of Animation family suite. Okay, I've never stayed at Art of Animation. I've never done the family suite, but even having never stayed there, I would still pick the one bedroom at Old Key West just for the price point. Again, going back to the cost, like you can stay in a one bedroom for half the price of those Art of Animation family suites and you still get more square footage. So I just, I still think it's worth it. I mean, you are, again, you're sacrificing being right on the Skyliner with Art of Animation. Maybe that's something you consider factoring into the cost, you know, paying a little bit extra to stay in a family suite so that you have access to the Skyliner, but how much is that really worth? You know what I mean? Um, it just depends. You can sleep more people in the Art of Animation suite, so that's another thing to consider, but I would still go with the one bedroom. You just have more square footage at a lower price point. Taking a preschooler, lunch and dinner options in the park. Okay. <laughs> I'm probably not the best person to answer this question because my preschooler is the pickiest eater ever. So we pack her a lunch and dinner because she right now will only eat a peanut butter sandwich or pizza. That is it. <laughs> so I have learned not to waste my money on the mac and cheese, the sandwiches, the chicken nuggets. Like if I spend money on those $10 kids meals, she's not gonna eat it. So <laughs> I just pack her a lunch and dinner. So we really aren't purchasing kids meals for my preschooler. She just isn't gonna eat it. So we don't even try to hunt down great options because she's not gonna like it anyway. <laughs> so we just pack our own food and 
that's what works for us. <laughs> Top advice for toddler road trip, we go in November. When did y'all give in with the tablet? Okay, we actually gave Ellie the tablet a little over an hour into our trip. I tried to last as long as possible, but I figured, you know what? We have a 10 hour <laughs> road trip ahead of us at that point and you know what, forget all screen time rules kind of go out the window when you're on a road trip, at least for us. So she got the tablet an hour into the road trip. And then when it comes to my top tips for a road trip with a toddler, I'll have some of my past videos linked down below. My road trip prep videos. I did a toddler road trip haul video last year. So all of those linked, but Overall, I would say make sure that you have plenty of snacks easily accessible, that you have your toddler dressed in very comfy clothes, really whatever you would feel comfortable in on a road trip. I try to dress my daughter in something similar, so bike shorts and a t-shirt. I always have an extra outfit for her, extra underwear just in case. We've got a whole potty set up in the back seat. We ended up not actually having to use that, which is best case scenario. You know, we didn't have to use any of that, so I'm very thankful. But outside of that, make sure you have a little basket of activities that's easily accessible. Just make sure everything is easily accessible. So if you are, mom, if you are in the passenger seat, make sure that you can easily reach things. I think that was probably the biggest key for us is making sure that I didn't accidentally bury something that I needed in the back um, and making sure that I wasn't gonna have to like do some acrobatic move to get to whatever I need in the back seat. So just make sure everything is easily accessible. And this question kind of goes hand in hand with the road trip thing as well. I need all the details on how the drive went. We're driving from Nashville in January with a three and six year old. Our drive was actually pretty uneventful, which that's great to say. I really don't have a lot to share <laughs> from our road trip. We don't have any crazy stories. There were no big meltdowns. Like Ellie just does great in the car. The only thing was trying to get her out of the car to go potty. <laughs> She did not want to get out of her car seat and that was the only time she got a little worked up was because we made her get out of the car seat to go potty and walk around for a little bit. Other than that, we tried to do as little stops as possible and we just drove straight there. We made three stops. Everyone was good to go. You know, it was very uneventful. Ideal trip layout for first time family with one toddler. Okay. How I would structure this trip, I would have at least four full park days, like minimum four full days so that you can experience each of the four parks and then have a fifth day as your rest day right in the middle of that. So I would do minimum five full days at Disney, that way you can do it all, but you still have a day in the middle to kind of take a breather. Um, it really doesn't matter what parks you do in what order. I would just make sure to double check party days if you're gonna be there during Halloween or Christmas time and coordinate your park day according to party schedules, if that makes sense. The other thing I would definitely make sure you do is take that midday break with your toddler. That is a non-negotiable, and I know so many other mamas here will attest, you need that midday break, especially if you have little ones, go back to the room, it's so worth it. I know it might feel like in the moment, like, oh, we're sacrificing precious park time, we paid so much to be here, but when you go back late afternoon, early evening, and everyone feels fresh and rejuvenated, you will be so thankful <laughs> that you took that midday break, and then everyone is able to last past fireworks and everyone's happy and feeling good. You know, it's nine o'clock and everyone's feeling good. So it will be worth it. Take that midday break. But that's how I would structure it for a first time family with a toddler. Do those two full park days. Take a full rest day in the middle of your trip, whether that's a resort day or a pool day, and then end with two more full park days. What time do I have to get up to get there for early entry? Realistic morning schedule help. <laughs> It really depends, well, first on which park you're going to because that's gonna determine the park hours. But I would say generally early entry is 8.30 to 9 a.m. So let's just say that you're wanting to do Magic Kingdom and you're wanting to rope drop early entry. So this would be for the person who is like, I'm not getting there right when early entry opens. Like, 
I'm going to be first in line. <laughs> so if you're that person and you want to be first in line, I would get there an hour before early entry. So I would bank on 730 if you really truly want to be there for rope drop for early entry. And the nice thing about Magic Kingdom getting there before early entry is that you can get all those castle photos, Starbucks is open, so you can get your coffee, hang out on the hub grass, take some pictures, everyone's fresh. It's not super crowded. Like that would be the ideal, you know, early morning rope drop, early entry scenario. But I would plan on 7:30 and then again depending on what resort you're staying at, it could potentially take you 30 to 45 minutes to get from your resort through security to the front gate. But working backwards, if you want to be there at 7.30, I would leave your resort by 6.45, probably 7 o'clock at the latest. So that would be how I would plan out that morning and I would make sure everyone is up starting to get ready around 6 a.m. So that's kind of how I would structure that morning. Um, we're not a rope drop family. <laughs> But for the sake of this question, that is exactly what I would do. What age did Ellie sleep in a bed at Disney and not in a pack and play? Ellie is very tall for her age. So it really was just past two and a half, almost three years old, where I was like, I can't put her in a pack and play anymore. <laughs> like she's just too tall. Her little legs were like pushing up against the netting in the pack and play. So I decided, okay, we've got to retire the pack and play and we've got to move her to a real bed. We ended up staying in resorts that have that pull down fifth sleeper bed. So that was really nice. So it was a good transition to go from a pack and play. And then of course she has like a toddler size bed at home. So she's used to that smaller, like tiny bed. <laughs> so I like that we could have something similar at Disney. But yeah, it was just before she turned three years old that I retired the pack and play and decided it was time to move her to a real bed. But we definitely stretched the pack and play phase for as long as possible because the bathroom strategy just was working so well for us where we could put her in the pack and play in the bathroom. Andy and I, or just me on my own, had you know the rest of the room to ourselves. So that worked so well for so long and we just weren't ready to sacrifice that. And so now when she takes naps or goes to bed, you know, we're just kind of tiptoeing around in the dark, basically. <laughs> but you gotta do what you gotta do. Favorite restaurants on this trip? One restaurant that I hadn't done in a really long time, actually, I don't know if we've ever done this one for dinner, was Kona Cafe. This one really surprised me. We've done breakfast there, but I don't know if I'd ever done dinner. And it was really good. So I think this is a great one if you can't get into Ohana and maybe you can't get a reservation there or you're just wanting to experience the Polynesian and dine there at a lower price point. That's another really great option. So I really enjoyed Kona Cafe. Have you ever had a negative experience with renting DVC points? Anytime that I have worked with DVC Rental Store, David's Vacation Club Rentals, Shop DVC, I've never had any issues. They are all so incredible. Great customer service, great communication. I've never had any issues. There was one time that I rented DVC points through a non-Disney, just a general timeshare rental company called Red Week. I've used them for a stay at Old Key West and a stay at Grand Floridian. So it's worked out just fine. It's just a very different process and experience when you are not working with a Disney third party company like DVC Rental Store. So the only negative experience I had was very slow communication, very confusing because you're working directly with the owner and there's no true mediator. You know, you can always contact customer service and support, but you're mostly in communication with the owner and it can just get a little confusing. It, communication can be slow. Sometimes they want you to write them a check. <laughs> Sometimes they want you to pay through Venmo and you're paying the owner directly and they send you their own contract. So there's definitely a level of like a lack of security with that. So I don't recommend going through Red Week. <laughs> unless you're feeling like you just want to live on the edge and take your chances. But, um, you know, it, it just wasn't the best experience. I only look on Red Week if I'm like desperate <laughs> to find something. 
but they add on a lot of fees. There's a lot of booking fees. There's, you know, it's, I don't recommend them. So that is the only time that I have had a negative experience with renting DVC points, but anytime I have used a reputable company like DVC Rental Store, David's Shop DVC, it has all gone flawless. <laughs> How frequently do you book your trips? It really wasn't until about a year ago that YouTube really started taking off for me and this became my full-time job and I was able to start going to Disney way more than just a couple times a year, three times a year, which is already crazy. Like to go three times a year is already a lot. <laughs> and so I started going about every couple months, which like just saying that out loud is like, what? <laughs> And then these past few months, I've been going about every six weeks, which again is just insane to say, but I think I'm definitely starting to feel it. And I shared this in like a day in the life vlog that I did recently talking about going to Disney and just doing this for a living and just how I'm feeling about it. I definitely don't know how long I can maintain this pace. It's just not realistic or sustainable to go to Disney World every six weeks. And there's so much <laughs> that I could share with that, um, so much. But I'm definitely processing a lot just with the future of my channel and do I want to continue going to Disney World every six weeks? I won't dive into that in this video, but to answer that question, <laughs> Right now, we have been going about every six weeks. Um, my next trip is November, and after that, I don't have another trip booked. I don't know what the next several months look like, but for right now, I've got my trip booked in November, and after that, we shall see. What do you normally spend on food for you and your family when it's all of you? Okay, so I actually took a screenshot of my receipt that Disney sends you at the end of the week because I thought it'd be helpful to share. Like, what does another family <laughs> spend on food, drinks, souvenirs? Well, we actually don't buy souvenirs. That's just not something we're into. Um, we actually didn't even buy Ellie anything. Normally, we'll let her pick something out at the end of the trip and she wanted gummies. <laughs> so <laughs> that was her souvenir. But for five nights, six days, for three people, we spent $1,110.34 on all of our dining. And that's about what I was expecting. I did leave a little bit of wiggle room, but that was pretty much what I budgeted for. So I felt really good about that. But for six days, three people, yeah, just over $1,000. So that is that is dining at Disney World for you. <laughs> How do you handle if Ellie gets overstimulated? My oldest has sensory overload at Disney we will pretty much just leave the park. I mean, if it gets to a point where I know that Ellie is done, she's overstimulated, she gets a little fussy, starts getting whiny, like it starts showing in her behavior, and I feel like that's perfectly normal at that age. And so I can start to tell, okay, we need to kind of wrap this up, like let's finish up this last thing we're doing, and then we need to make our way to the exit. Um, I try not to push it past that point if she starts to get a little whiny. I try not to just be like, oh, suck it up. Like <laughs> we're on to the next character meet and greet. You know, I pretty much in that moment will say, okay, we need to be done. That's pretty much how I handle it at Disney with her. I really release myself from trying to fix it because I've learned <laughs> from trial and error that that's just not gonna work. And the only thing that's gonna help her is a nap or some kind of quiet time where we go back to the room and she actually will go to sleep or we'll lay there and I can give her a book to flip through something that is not overstimulating basically. So that is what I do. Do you buy Genie Plus? So I actually just did a reel about this over on Instagram, which if you're not following me on Instagram, definitely head over and check it out. But we do not buy Genie Plus. And that's not to say that we won't ever buy Genie Plus. I think there are definitely certain times where it makes sense. But for us and the way we do Disney, it's just not worth it. So we really enjoy a lot of the shows, characters and attractions that don't require Genie Plus and we stay 
plenty busy without Genie Plus and without spending that additional money. Um, so this entire last trip that we went on, we didn't buy Genie Plus for any of our days. And there were a couple of days towards the end of our trip where the parks got a little more crowded and we definitely could have purchased Genie Plus, but we chose not to. For instance, on our Animal Kingdom day, we knew that we wanted to do the Moana meet and greet, and that's not something that you can get a lightning lane for anyway. It's just a standby line. So we got there in the morning and we did that. And then we knew we wanted to do Festival of the Lion King, which you can get a lightning lane for any of the shows to get priority seating, but we were able to experience the show just fine without a lightning lane. Um, so we stay plenty busy without it and we don't have to spend the extra money. Um, so for a few reasons, it just hasn't been a great fit for our family and it's one less thing to keep up with throughout the day even though the process of booking lightning lanes is pretty simple. I like not having to think about, okay, what do we wanna do next? Okay, this time is available. Let me modify it to get it sooner. Like, it just gets me off my phone a little bit more and I can focus more on creating content or just spending time with my daughter and my family. Um, so that is why we do not buy Genie Plus. Okay, this is a good one. How do you keep the Disney magic fresh time and again? For us, I really try to make our trips feel unique and fun and different every single time. So whether that's staying at a different resort or experiencing new dining options or prioritizing shows and attractions that are brand new that we've never done before, like there are always new things at Disney. <laughs> and so it's always funny to me when people will ask me like, don't you get bored going to Disney over and over? And I'm like, there are still things that I have never done. There are still resorts that I've never stayed at and we could keep going and our next trip will be totally different from our last. We'll do brand new things that we never did on, on our previous trip. Um, so for instance, like the Christmas party, that's something we're doing on our next trip. I've never done one of the holiday parties before, so this will be a first for me. And I think that's a huge piece in keeping that Disney magic <laughs> fresh is making your trip intentionally different than anything you've done before. Is stroller parking in the parks tricky? Do you recommend a strategy for that? There's really no strategy. Whenever we get on any kind of show or attraction, you just kind of look around or there's signs or cast members pointing to the nearest stroller parking area. And for us, okay, <laughs> this might be controversial, but we leave our backpack on the stroller. So what I've actually done, I'll have to show this in a video actually, because I've never seen anyone do this before. So you know when you're pushing your stroller and you have the stroller clips and your you know backpack diaper bag is hanging from the stroller. What we do instead of unclipping the backpack and setting it in the seat, what we do, and actually my husband <laughs> discovered this, I was like, mom, that's actually a really smart idea, is take the backpack and we just flip it over so it's still actually hooked on to the stroller and it's flipped over into the seat. So it's not gonna tip over if someone bumps it. And if a cast member needs to move the stroller, you know, it's out of the way and, but it's still hooked on. So someone would have a really hard time stealing our backpack <laughs> if they wanted to. It would be pretty tricky and they would have to like really like, get underneath to unclip it or they'd have to flip it over and figure that out. So anyway, that's a tip that I've never heard anyone share before and my husband discovered that. So that is what we do. We'll just flip the backpack over. And then my other tip for stroller parking is when you come out of whatever the attraction show restaurant is, don't panic <laughs> if your stroller is not where you left it. Spend a few minutes and look around because cast members are known for kind of regrouping strollers to be a little more organized and they'll move everyone's strollers to kind of line them up in a more orderly fashion to make room for new strollers to ease on in and you know so don't panic when you walk out i've been in that moment before where you walk out and your heart drops you're like where is my stroller it's not where i left it i know it was right here and then you take a few minutes and you're like, oh, okay, there it is. So don't panic. Just know it's perfectly normal for your stroller to get moved. You know, if you spend more than five or 10 minutes looking for it, then I would alert a cast member, but give it a few minutes. I'm sure 
it just got moved. When you fly down, why don't you rent a car versus using the buses? So for a long time, we actually would fly down and rent a car, especially when it was just me and Andy. We really liked having a car, and especially if we stay at Old Key West, we will always have a car, whether it's our own or a rental, we always will have a car. But mostly, I feel like this past year, my trips have been with just me and Ellie. And I think having the ease of private transportation from the airport to our resort, and then staying at a resort where we can rely on Disney transportation, it just simplifies things for me as a mom traveling solo. I just really prefer using Disney transportation when I'm on my own as compared to having to worry about, you know, parking and lots of walking. It's just a different style trip when we drive. And I really enjoy having a car at Disney, but I usually have my husband with me and he drives. <laughs> so that's another reason that, you know, if he's not there with me, I just, prefer not to have a car because I don't want to be the one driving. Um, and again, it just simplifies and it's one less thing to, you know, maneuver with a preschooler when I'm traveling alone. It just kind of takes the guesswork out. I can just get on the bus, the boat, the Skyliner, and we're on our way. That's why I don't rent a car with Ellie. I just like the simplicity of Disney transportation. But yes, if we're at Old Key West or my husband's with me, we'll have a car. <laughs> okay, this one's about Old Key West. Do you recommend Turtle Pond Road without a car? So if you cannot get near the hospitality house, I personally think that Old Turtle Pond Road is probably the next best thing because you're kind of in that central area of the resort. So you're close to the Turtle Pond Pool, you're close to the Turtle Shack and the playground over there. So you have some extra amenities that you don't on other sections of the resort outside of the hospitality house. Um, I think it's still a great location even if you don't have a car because again, you're kind of that middle stop. So whether you're coming or going, you know, you'll be kind of middle of the road when it comes to pick up and drop off. So that's kind of nice. I think in the future, if we aren't able to get Hospitality House, I really loved Old Turtle Pond Road and that'll probably be my requested area on future trips. In-room date nights at Disney with kids, if you know, you know. <laughs> What's the cheapest one bedroom? Well, the cheapest one bedroom will be Old Key West or at Saratoga. Those are gonna be the two best one bedroom options on a budget. And then when it comes to date nights at Disney in the room, so if you like to be back in the room earlier with your little one for bedtime, first thing that comes to mind for a date night is to get some kind of dessert treat you know whatever it is maybe go to Gideon's cookies get those to go and save them for back in your room and watch a movie and if you're in just a regular hotel room or you're in a studio you can always bring a laptop and put headphones in <laughs> that's what we've done so that way we're not disturbing Ellie who is sound asleep and we can eat our cookie in bed and have our headphones in and watch a movie. So that would be my go-to date in room date night with a toddler preschooler um, sleeping, you know, five feet away from you. But if you have a one bedroom, I mean, that's nice too, because we were able to have the entire bedroom area while Ellie slept on the little pullout couch in the living room. And then we would just like sneak out to the fridge at night if we needed to get a bottle of water or, you know, whatever. Another thing I just remembered, I don't know why I haven't talked about this sooner. And this actually is the perfect question for this. We actually ordered DoorDash one night <laughs> to our one bedroom at Old Key West. And we had thought about just getting Olivia's Cafe to go and bringing it back to the room, but we were all ready in our pajamas in bed and neither one of us wanted to get up and get dressed and <laughs> get out to go pick up the food so we were like well let's just do DoorDash so I ordered DoorDash from a really incredible Mexican restaurant and put our room number at Old Key West and we had Mexican food delivered <laughs> to our one bedroom at Old Key West it was the best thing ever it was unbelievable I don't know why we've never done that before i'm like wow this is incredible like this it just feels like a normal night at home like getting takeout you know mexican takeout like it was so great so 
don't forget that that is an option as well that you can actually have DoorDash delivered to your resort. Now, if you're not staying in an apartment style resort like Saratoga or Old Key West, say you're staying at like Wilderness Lodge, I believe you would have to go down to the lobby and like pick up your order with Bell Services or be waiting in the lobby like where cars can pull up to pick up your order. But you can have DoorDash delivered to your Disney resort and it was pretty amazing. So that would be, okay, that would actually be my go-to date night at Disney. Okay, I'm scrolling through the rest of the questions and there's a lot about Old Key West. So I actually have a resort tour and review video coming soon. So definitely check that out if your question did not get answered. I have a feeling that a lot of those questions will be answered in that video. So that will be coming soon. So be on the lookout for that. But I think I'm gonna wrap it up here so thank you guys so much for watching. I love doing these Q&A videos and just getting to chat with you guys. So thanks again for watching and I will see you in my next one. Bye.